This is Dr. Jonathan Hansen. I'm the president of World Ministries International. I want to welcome you to the warning television program. Those that are listening on radio, shortwave welcome, and those that are watching on social media, welcome. My message today is going to be the peaceful heart. Now, we're in a live audience. We're in the chapel at World Ministries International, where we do our Bible school, as well as our staff meeting every week for a, a service. In today's uncertain world, where there are changing daily, the world is constantly in a change right now. We need to learn the principles of obtaining a peaceful heart. We are all witnessing an escalation of control being waged up against people and nations. Revelation chapter 13 is getting closer where people will be urged to take eventually the mark of the beast. My message today is titled, The Peaceful Heart. Text, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, report, if there are any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now that alone, if we wanted to unpackage this, package this verse, like I have a program called Unpackaging, Unraveling the Scriptures, we could talk about this the whole time. Tremendous truth in here that can give you comfort in the middle of a storm. Paul had learned three revelations that resulted not only in having, quote, the peace of God, unquote, within his heart, but having the peace of God with him. No doubt Paul had practiced these truths through all the challenges and disappointments he endured in the ministry. As we read about Paul's life, we see that he faced all the adversities that life can throw at a person. He had the Physical challenges that resulted in him being beaten with rods and lashes, as well as him being stoned to death, dragged out of the city where he was left for dead. He faced hunger, the elements, dangerous animals, financial shortages, imprisonment, and the betrayal of many of his friends. Yet he learned how to live with peace in his heart. Really contemplate, think about what I'm reading and saying today. Amen. Second Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I've been in the deep in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, unquote. I don't know a man alive that went through what Paul did and came out victorious. Because he learned to have the peace of God in the middle of the storm. Now, that's easy to say. It's hard to do. Many people, yes, yes, yes. I'd like to see you go through some of this and see if you have the peace of God or cursing, screaming. Denying Christ and everything else to save your life and get out of prison. Think about it. It's easy to, yes, yes. It's a little hard to do. It's like people criticize the Christians in Germany when Hitler took over, but yet we're seeing a lot of tyranny in the United States. I don't see Christians doing anything much about it. It's Germany all over again. 
So you can talk big, but can you live the talk? That's the question. On June 2nd, 2021, at around 8.28 p.m., during my evening prayer service, I received a telephone call from Hawaii saying my daughter had fainted, fallen, and with seizures and was rushed to the hospital. I talked to the hospital, to a doctor who I talked to many other medical professionals that night who told me that her injuries were serious, that she was in a very critical condition, and they could not promised me she would live. They only said, quote, we are trying. We will do our best, unquote. They did say her injuries do not look accidental. That usually these type of severe injuries do not happen by simply fainting. But that it appears as though your daughter has been a victim of an assault. They said they think I should come if I don't want to miss anything, unquote. What did that mean? Well, I knew what they meant if I want to hear the dying words of her life. If she, but she couldn't even speak. She was intubated. I did what I could. I went through the COVID test. I caught a plane as fast as I could, which was a Saturday. This was a Wednesday night. Obviously, I was troubled. And on the plane... God gave me a word. But let me just go into it just a bit further. From June the 2nd, 2021 until June 17, Melita was on an intubator, life support, with a breathing machine keeping her alive. She was fighting for her life from a double skull fracture with bleeding in the brain, blood gushing out of the nose, huge blood clots coming out of her mouth, and they couldn't stop it. They gave me no hope, just daily would say, quote, we are doing our best, unquote. June 5, 2021 at 1.53 p.m. Saturday, as soon as I could catch a flight, the Lord gave me a word verbatim, quote, I am doing a work. It will be okay. Trust in me and see my handiwork. For what man cannot do or, or imagine, I will do. It will exceed all your imagination, says the Lord, unquote. Amen. I stood on that word. I, I had relative peace on the rest of that journey. I stood on that word every day. June 9, 2021, at 8.28 a.m., while in my bed, I received the following word from the Lord. I am bringing her out of her wilderness. She has been in into her promised land, unquote. So these two words I held on to. Every day, I looked at it and said, another day of victory. I started my day, another day of victory. A pastor, Eric Hurd, who you know, he's been here several times. We would pray. We would take every day what was, we were facing that day. Go into intercession. Take authority over spirits. Speak life. We do that morning and night. When I walked in Saturday, after getting this word from the plane, from the Lord, and I walked in heavily sedated, Heavily sedated. They said it's as much sedation as they could give. They couldn't believe it. Intubated. <laughs> and I walked in and held her hand and spoke. And she stood. She, her back came up and then dropped back. <laughs> and I cried. They couldn't believe it. Intubated. Somehow. She knew I was there. Hallelujah. They couldn't stop the bleeding from the double skull fracture. Back of the head, front, nose. Two weeks, couldn't stop it. They did everything. Clamps, gauze, three feet apiece, stuffed in blood clots coming out of the mouth. 
The surgeon said, we've got, we've got to do surgery. It's very risky. It's dangerous, but there's no other choice. Will you sign off? So I signed off. Every day I would anoint her with oil. This day I anointed her again and prayed. And then I looked at the surgeon. I said, can I pray for you? She says, please. I prayed. She said, thank you. She came out. She lived. Amen. Every day fighting for her life. One day intubated, going to arrhythmia, the heart. And they weren't sure what to do anymore. They were ready to shock her. I rebuked the spirit of death. She just gushed out vomit over the whole bed. The heart came back to normal. They said, I, normally we don't like them vomiting, but it worked. I think they were probably amazed. I was... I was Happy. Amen. I think there was a partial deliverance. I am bringing her out of her wilderness. She's going to be okay. She will be in her promised land. I held on to those words. Amen. My message again. The peaceful heart. One, casting your cares upon the Lord. Now Malita is still recovering. I was in Hawaii with her for five weeks, one day. Made sure three weeks in ICU, more time in the hospital, that she was no longer in physical danger. She had neuro neurological damage from the brain. They said that it would be chronic. I would have to one day maybe take her to a Colorado hospital that specializes in brain injuries. Well, I didn't believe that. They said she wouldn't live, but I didn't believe that. Hallelujah. She has a destiny. She has her purpose. I went there to fight and I fought every day, 12 to 14 hours a day by her bedside. Amen. Can you fight? Do you know how to fight or do you give up? I wasn't giving up. Before I came back, the brain surgeon, who they just about did brain surgery because she had been bleeding in the brain. Then it stopped. He looked at her again before I got on this plane to come back here and said, you know, I'm amazed. Things are healing in the brain and she might not have to go to Colorado one day. This young lady has a destiny. She's going to be perfect. Amen. And God is dealing with her issues right now. Yes. Physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. Amen. It's time to run to God. And I believe she's been looking at God as when she's been conscious. I've been having the words of God spoken to her, reading scriptures, praying and her praying with me. And when she was unconscious, speaking the words of God over her. Hallelujah. The promises of God. The words and promises in scripture of healing. Again, point number one. Casting your cares upon the Lord. The first truth Paul shares that will result in a peaceful heart is to cast your cares upon the Lord. And I did that every day. Morning and night with this pastor, I did it all day. You can have words of God and the devil will still try to attack you to doubt. It was a horrific warfare, not only for her survival, her life. But are we going to stand on the word of God or give up? When he says to take our worries to God in prayer, he simply is saying, tell God about it and make him responsible for the outcome. What is it that? We usually are anxious about if not the overcomes the situation. What overcomes the situation? Are you worried about losing your job or have you already lost it? Maybe you're worried about where the next job will come from. Are you anxious about your children's future or the health of a loved one? The list can go on and on with things that cause people to have mental distress, emotional illness, cycle. 
psychological problems, psychosomatic diseases. Certainly, Paul had plenty of reasons to get worried since he had already experienced so much pain and anguish in his life. Just the thought that some of these things could occur again would be enough to cause anxiety in the strongest person. I can tell you, I never want to go through that again. I never wanted to go through over five years of fighting for Jeannie's life, my first wife's life. I would fought for my life several times and got supernaturally delivered. Tumors disappearing off my lungs. Supernatural. If you don't have an operation, you'll be dead by morning. You're bleeding to death. And they gave me a, I said, give me the shot. Lay hands and pray. But I will not let you have cut me because God said no. They gave me the shot. I woke up two days later. I was healed. Somehow, God healed the bleeding in, this, in the body. Hallelujah. We need to hear from God. We need to stand on his word. Yes. Stand on the promises. Stand on his word. Accept his sovereignty. I knew Melita had a destiny. My first wife went on to be with the Lord. And she's happier there than she would ever be with me. There are purposes for all things. We accept God's sovereignty. And God's brought me another wife that, again, been a tremendous blessing. Paul had learned to let God be responsible for the outcomes of all that could happen in life. Second Timothy 1.12, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until the day. So Paul learned to let God be responsible for everything that happened in his life. Whether he lived, whether he died, whether he was beaten in prison, whether God delivered him. Whether the earthquake quake came as they prayed and he walked free. Or whether he bowed his head to go to eternity, knowing full well he would be executed and he went anyway. When we make God responsible for the outcome of our situation by telling him about it and thanking him for taking care of us in advance, he will do exactly what he promised in his word to do. He will give us peace in the eye of the storm. He can bring us out of the storm. He can give us a glorious welcoming home, thy good and faithful servant. The peace of God is always there. If you have intimate relationship with him and you stand on his promises. You know, I see Jesus. I could tell you so many stories of people. Going to be with the Lord. Doctor accounts or coming back from the dead and what they witnessed. And people never want to come back. We prayed for one woman and she said, why did you pray for me for two years? Heaven was so beautiful. They don't want to come back. They never want to come back. Heaven is real. That's where we are supposed to be eventually. They don't want to come back. In fact, that woman said, why did you bring me back? The earth is so dirty. Well, the Lord used her to be a missionary. God will do exactly as he promised. Therefore, instead of dreaming of the terrible things that could happen. We are imagining the outcomes by to be according to God, how he promised, since he's the one responsible for that situation. You can let your mind, even though God gives you a word, even though the word of God is through the, the scriptures, the promise of God, you can still let your mind run rampant and destroy your peace and get all beat up. It's a fight. I fought every day for five weeks in a day. Some of you know that. Yeah, yeah. We needed the brethren praying for us. We need people holding our hands. We are not an island. We're not the lone ranger. That's the reason for the ecclesia, for the body, why we meet every week. Amen. If you think you can stand on your own, I'll say a scriptural definition, you're a fool. You don't understand the word of God. You don't accept the word of God in your own vanity. You think you can do it by yourself. And God says, that's a fool. 
You can't stand on your own. Like a person that says, I can live without a house. Try it around here in the four seasons. I think you will die. And without being part of the church, I'm afraid you are pretty pathetic. You can criticize a lot, but I don't see you moving in the fullness of God. Paul's second step to have a peaceful heart is found in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lo lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue in these, praise the Lord and meditate on these things. And that's what I did every day. And when the devil attacked, I went right back. Satan, get behind me. This is what God said. She's going to come out of her wilderness. She is going to live. Point number two, control your thoughts. Paul knew that Satan would be trying to devour us with mental bombardment of negative thoughts after we have cast our care upon the Lord. This is how the enemy attacks us and attempts to take back the things that we have given to the Lord to take care of us. Apostle Peter understood the same strategic warfare and explained it to the Christians at Rome in his first letter, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 8. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon the Lord. He cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Casting your cares on the Lord, for he cares for you. The devil is going to try to take away your peace. Resist him. Go back to the promises of God. Don't dwell on the negative, what could happen, what he says will happen. Control every thought, every imagination. Again, we see the admonition of the apostle, cast your cares on God. Making God responsible for the outcome. And then, man the watchtower because the enemy will try to devour you, thinking with those same anxious thoughts that you have just released to God. However, we can successfully resist the devil by taking the thoughts captive and replacing them with positive thoughts. Paul tells us to meditate on Philippians 4.8, the thoughts that issued, issue from st stopping our peace. Someone once said you can stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can't stop it from building a nest in your hair. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can have the promises of God. That doesn't mean you stand on them. God gives you a word and you go right back to the enemy's doubt and unbelief. And now you're in torment and anxiety. Same is true with our thought life. We can't stop thoughts from coming, but we can stop them from staying. It may take some diligent effort to resist the enemy in our thoughts. But eventually he will flee if you keep resisting him and going back to the promises of God. Amen. Man, goodness, that's what I did day in and day out, even at night if I couldn't sleep. Going back to the promises of God. Paul gives us a final step for having a peaceful heart in verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do. And the God of peace be with you. And final point, Copy your mentors, point number three. Paul had proven many truths in his life. He had learned to live by faith in the grace of God to an amazing degree. Paul was always my hero growing up, young man, right to now. He'd become a model of victory for everyone. He could boldly say, follow me as I follow Christ. Because the word of God had become incarnated in him. It had become so a part of him. He lived it. Notice how detailed his instructions were. Things which you have learned, things which you received, things which you heard, things which you saw in me. Do these things and a God of peace will be with you. What a leader to follow, amen? amen. Paul didn't leave out any method of instruction. He covered every possible way the believers have gleaned from his life, depending on their relationship with him as their apostle. Some people may have personally interacted with him. Others may have just heard people talk about his life. And some have seen him handling the distresses and challenges of life.
Hebrews 13, 7, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct, follow them. Paul was worry, worthy to be followed, to be listened to, to be emulated. And our great high priest, Jesus, has given those same, same instructions. We cannot stand alone. We need to be connected to one another. We need to learn the secrets of living by faith and walking in the peace of God. Paul had Timothy. Elijah had Elisha. And you could go on and on. They all discipled others who led in the faith and had many people. They were tutoring under them. Process of discipleship. There's no st substitute for observing another person's life. Many of you have been with me over 22 years. Paul says specifically that we're supposed to cast our cares, control our thoughts, copy him, copy our mentors, and God will give you peace. Genesis 8, 8 through 11, he also sent from him a dove to see if the water had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her feet. She returned into the ark, for the water was, were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark, and he waited another seven days. And again he sent out the dove from the ark. Then the dove came to him in a certain evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and no one knew the water had receded from the earth. There's much symbolism in this passage. The dove represents the Holy Spirit, the olive branch. Speaks of peace. Noah was limited by what he could see. The waters within range had not receded. But with the help of the dove, he could know what is beyond his sight. This is what we call revelation knowledge. And is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us as believers in Christ. We also see Noah representing a believer who is led by the Spirit. And waits for the Holy Spirit before he makes his final decisions and actions in his life. Regarding the peace of God, we can learn from the story that God will make his habitation where people have learned to trust in him. By casting their cares on him, controlling their thoughts, and copying their mentors. The Holy Spirit, like a dove, dwells where there is an atmosphere of faith and trust in God's word. We find that our communion with God is much more intimate when we have learned to live worry-free and practice prayer with thanksgiving. Paul had the God of peace manifested in miraculous ways due to his application of this teaching that he has modeled for all believers. And may you experience the God of peace. Amen. God bless you.